Thank you, David. Yes, so I'm going to talk about connectivity, which means lava exchanges between reefs of both quartz and coral, and how this can help us uh, target the effort better um, when it comes to uh, ground from starfish control. So, um, for this, this is actually a modeling study, so we use this larval dispersal models, which means that we simulate uh, how larvae spread from populations on source reefs and um, uh, where do they get in terms of um, how, I mean, well, where do they disperse, with what other reefs do they disperse? And for that we use um, indicative reef boundaries uh, for uh, as both sources and sinks, and then we use simulated uh, hydrodynamics from oceanographic models. So it's E-reefs hydrodynamics coupled with Coney from Scott Condi and his team at CSRO for, as a particle tracking tool. And so we can then simulate the larval dispersal from a reef um, from a source reef and see where those larvae end up uh, and where they're more likely to go, so which links are, which kind of link, connectivity links are stronger or weaker. So, and then we can do, uh, so with these models we can, we can simulate the dispersal from one reef, but we can also simulate this, the dispersal of all the reefs on the GPR, so which gives us a connectivity network which we can then in which we can then focus on a particular area that interests us and see how these reefs are connected by larval exchanges, again, either coral or quartz. So when it comes to using connectivity for decision making, uh, we, um, we, can, um, uh, we can use these um, source-sync relationships to support where, which reefs are going to be regionally more important as sources or sinks of lobby, but we're most interested in sources. So when it comes to coral, we are looking for uh, good sources of, of larvae that are going to promote either persistence or recovery. And when it comes to cods, we are looking at both exposure, so the reefs that are going to be exposed to cods larvae, uh, uh, and propagation, so the reefs that are going to be likely to spread the outbreaks, uh, uh, spread the larvae and possibly spread the outbreaks as well. So, um, when, when, so a bit more detail what we are looking for when we're talking about corals. So we're looking for quality source reefs, which means that they need to have healthy adult stocks. And unfortunately, connectivity models can't tell us that. But so we have so we have to sometimes assume that the reefs actually have coral stocks. But what we're looking for is the reefs that have high local replenishment potential, which means they can export lots of larvae to lots of reefs. Uh, and they can do this, this con consistently, which means over different years, and uh, um, preferably for different species and under different local conditions as well. So, and reefs that can do this consistently, so export lots of larvae to lots of other reefs, are going to be important for local supply, but we can also look at sources that are important for regional recovery, which means that these reefs are going to supply reefs that are themselves going to be sources, and so this is going to actually promote recovery in the wider region. When it comes to cots, we can look at uh, two things. So for coral, we're mostly looking for sources, but for cots, we're also looking at exposure. So uh, the assumption is that reefs that can get more larvae, more cots more larvae are more likely to have outbreaks later. So it can come from many different reefs, or it can be very strong links to, to known outbreaks. Or, and then, so we can have reefs that are, does this have a, yes, okay, well, okay, well, I have two screens, so I can't actually use it, but yes, the reefs on the, on the left are, are going to have, are going to be good sinks, and they're going to have high exposure to, to larvae, and then the, these reefs would be poor sinks. And then we can also look at, again, so, uh, assessing potential for outbreak propagation, so for uh, spreading the larvae in the, in the system, and then we have, again, good sources and poor sources, and then we can combine these categories and then, oh yes, and we can again look at local sources, but also we can look at regional sources, so the reefs that are going to make the whole regional situation, potential to make the regional situation worse. And then we can use this for prioritization of, target, of uh, control efforts. So the reefs that is a both has high risk of getting caught and then being good source later should be high priority, for example. Um, so, we also wanted to validate these models, so to, to see that they're actually doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, so, and we did this by comparing the connectivity predictions for between 2008 and 2012, and then against uh, sort of cuts, so, so this is actually larval accumulation for a four-year period, before the FMP management program started to survey the, to survey the reefs, 
And the idea is that the reefs that have more exposure to larvae are going to be more likely to have adult coats later. And when we look at the data, uh, or when, we, when we compare the predictions to the data, so the, the assumption is low supply means low risk later, and high supply means high risk. Um, and, and this is actually what happens. So we see that reefs that had low prediction, low predicted exposure to coats larvae, get uh, the later surveys found fewer adult coats on them as opposed to reefs that had high supply of larvae. Um, so the connectivity model predictions match the later surveys, and they're particularly good in saying which reefs will not have coats uh, on them. So uh, which, um, you know, we, we, we tend to want to find outbreaks, but this is also actually useful because we can uh, find the reefs that are not going to have coats, so they can actually support a regional recovery. And it's also something good when you go to a new region that we can say, well, okay, we don't know anything about this region, but we don't have to necessarily look for these, look at these reefs because they're very unlikely to have coats. Uh, so yes, yeah, so this is for exposure when it comes to propagation. Uh, so the propagation actually uh, means that, okay, uh, cots are on this reef, there's an outbreak on this reef, and we know there's a connection to that reef. Can we predict that the, that, that downstream reef is actually going to have outbreak later? And the answer is yes, but it's not, it's not, so, you know, yes, but to an extent, to show us that. So, uh, so the model actually works in terms of mathematics, and this is like an example where you know you, you get a nice relationship, but how useful it is actually in applied sense that that's a different question because as you see, we have so this is so down uh, uh, on the x-axis we have relative supply from outbreaks, and then we have a probability of. Uh, later observing an outbreaks in, uh, in a later period, and we see that there are lots of reefs that actually had high exposure but didn't get caught, and we some reefs that had low exposure according to, predict to the model predictions and did have caught. So the, the, you know, the prediction is uh, good, but you know it's not perfect. So we want we want to improve it, and there are lots of reasons why this could actually happen. So for example, we, these models can't don't incorporate post settlement processes yet. We need better information from, about outbreaks, so maybe sometimes re, uh, the cuts uh, came from reefs that haven't been surveyed that had outbreaks and then they actually uh, propagated to other reefs downstream. Um, so there's maybe uh, the reefs were surveyed before the outbreak could actually develop, so we, we, we say that they don't have outbreaks when they actually do have outbreaks, and of course we can always improve the connectivity models. So the take home message from this is actually that the general trends in the model in terms of propagation of outbreaks are captured well, but the connectivity is only part of the story, of course. And this is actually, uh, I think this is pretty good given that this is just connectivity models and that we can actually do these things. Uh, so, so come up to a prediction like this. Uh, so, okay, so this is uh, in terms of validation. But when we actually come to practical applications, uh, so we want to actually categorize reefs for prioritization, and this is this has been done in collaboration with Burma, uh, Mary Bogan, uh, and so we decided that we're going to actually categorize reefs into three major categories to see, uh, and uh, so we were going to look for potential coral sources, and that's going to be, um, and that's of course the positive thing. We're going to look for potential cod sources. And we're going to look for, which is a negative thing, and we're going to look at potential code sinks. So potential coral sources are going to help the recovery, code sources are going to make the situation worse, and uh, potential code sinks are actually going to have high risk of, uh, higher risk of, it, um, of having codes. Um, so, and then we can, so, so we can then map these three categories onto a region, like a region between uh, Cairns and Townsville, which is where the, most of the outbreaks are right now, and where they keep on, they continue to spread. And then we can look for, for example, reefs that are going to be consistently good larval sources. And so the reefs in red here are the reefs that have been identified to be uh, very good sources. So they're mostly large reefs. That's why it's that's why it looks at, like it's it's a lot of red in there. But so, so if you want to to help promote um, um, regional uh, recovery, these are the reefs that you should be paying attention to, um, if you believe the models of course. Uh, so, and then which reefs, uh, so, so these are, uh, also we can do the same thing for cost sources, so these are the reefs that are going to be bad news if they have, if they have outbreaks. They don't want necessarily have outbreaks, but if they do, they can actually spread the larvae and make the situation worse. And these are the reefs that are going to be uh, uh, that are going to have higher chance of experiencing COTS outbreaks, given that COTS are actually in the region. 
So these are the reads that you might want to check to see if they actually do have codes or because they're you know, you're more likely to find codes there. And so and then we can of course com combine these categories to actually come up with some meaningful goals. So for example, if you want to promote recovery, we want to actually look for coral sources. So we can, because we want to promote the, core, the recovery, but we can also combine this with code sin, saying this, okay, these are the sources, but they might be exposed to code larvae, so let's go there, find if they have codes, if they have codes, kill them, because if we kill the codes there, then we actually help the, the life, and we support the natural recovery processes through uh, connectivity. Or we can say, we, if we want to suppress outbreaks, we would go to reefs that have uh, that are both code sources and code sinks, so they are likely to have codes and they are likely to make the situation worse. So we can go there, and if you want to actually see, yes, we can combine all three categories, so these would be like the highly connected reefs in the region. Um, so um, yeah, they are obviously important for both codes and coral connectivity. Okay, and, and so this is the sort of recommendation that we have provided to Verpa, so that they can actually then um, and you know, it, it doesn't have to be actually cut off at 25 percentile, as, as I was showing. But uh, so this is a sort of um, scheme that you can use to prioritize reefs according to connectivity in any region of the GBR. So it doesn't have to be this region, but any region. So without knowing anything about this region, about where quotes are in, in a region, you can go, you can use the connectivity to actually do a first pass and go to reefs that are more likely to have quotes and where, it, where it's more likely to be. That they do. Okay, and then one final thing is uh, so we can so this is all um, basically saying like we don't know where cuts are, but this is this is how we would prioritize reefs. But we can actually do the same similar thing with with a specific disturbance in mind. So if we want to find the reefs that are going to be regionally important for the whole region recovering, so so for the whole region being resilient, not just one reef coming back, but the whole region coming back after a specific disturbance. So again, we would look, first we would look for reefs that have high replenishment potential, so they can supply lots of larvae to lots of reefs and potentially to other sources as well. So these would be the reefs that have, in this, you know, this is just a cartoon, so it's nothing, um, real, you know, it's not realistic data, but just a cartoon, so these would be the reefs that, that have this high replenishment potential. And then we can look at, okay, how likely are these reefs to have to be exposed to disturbances like bleaching, which was a big issue in the last couple of years. So because reefs that are going to be exposed to bleaching, they're not going to have healthy adult stocks. So we can we say, okay, these reefs are likely to have uh, reduced adult stocks, we, so we don't, so they actually need help instead of, are, and they're not able to necessarily provide help. So we exclude a few of those, and then we look at costs. So we want to see re which reefs are going to be at, lo at lower risk of have experiencing cuts and distributing cuts because um, so low exposure also means low risk of distribution. So these reefs, let's say we know that the cuts are here, and then we, we uh, predict that this is how the cuts are going to spread. So these reefs are also going to need help. So this elimin we eliminate these reefs, and therefore we, we end up with, with reefs that have potential to recover the, the disturbed reefs in the region. So these would be the regional important sources, and they're going to help the whole region, and sometimes the whole system, depending on how you define the system, sort of bounce back. And so this can be done for any footprint, so you can do this. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, this is the last thing. Uh, so, so yes, so you can actually find re which reefs are, you can, uh, for example, so that have four all four qualities, and they're going to be, and then we can, we can think about dynamic or permanent protection measures that can be implemented there to support the natural recovery processes on those reefs. So, uh, yes, and this is, this is, so we recently published a paper where we kind of did this for the whole of the GPR, but this can actually be done for each specific disturbance footprint, like cuts, outbreaks, bleaching, things like that. Okay, and with that, I would like to thank my co-authors and funding sources, and thank you.